are going to, to look at the end of chapter 11, just for a moment, just to remind us of where we've been, and then Romans chapter 12, we're going to take two verses, and look at those two verses, and, and I want you to think this morning of the, the subject of surrender. Surrender in your life. Is your life a surrendered life? Uh, entitled to living life from God's altar. Because we're going to talk about the altar of God today. Talk about living sacrifices. Concepts like commitment, consecration, surrender. And I want you to examine your own life as a believer. Now Paul has taken us through 11 chapters. I know everybody hadn't been here for, everybody but me hadn't been here for every single message that we've gone through as far as Romans. Maybe you have, but, but Paul has built a foundation. That starting in chapter 12, he's going to go from teaching us doctrine and then talk about dispensationalism, in other words, the Jews and their place and how God hadn't abandoned them. But he brings us all to one place, and that is the duty that we have a responsibility for. And because of all that God has done, why we should be, a certain way as the people of God. There is a one, one of our favorite hymns is probably when I survey the wondrous cross. When I get a true glimpse of God, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. You know, that's the same idea that Paul is is bringing us to at the end of chapter 11. A couple of things that he says at the end of chapter 11, verse 33 and 36. Oh, the depths and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. And then verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's Paul summing up the first 11 books of Romans. God is an astounding concept to try to to bring into our understanding it's impossible. It overwhelms us, the depths and the riches of who God truly is. And we recognize that from Him and through Him and to Him come all things. To Him be the glory forevermore. When you get a glimpse of God like that, then you are ready for what chapter 12 begins to introduce us to. And that is to surrender your life. To give God 100% of who you are. Paul says, therefore, because of everything that's gone on before, therefore I urge you, brethren, I urge you, brethren, to make your lives a living and holy sacrifice to God, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. A tremendous Display of what it means to surrender your life. I'm going to share with you three things this morning about what God is asking of us, each one of us, with regard to surrendering our life. Paul, it may amaze you. When we think of the New Testament church, we think of the New Testament church as being people who really had it right. And we always want to get back to being a New Testament type of church. But you know, Paul says here, I urge you, brethren. That tells me that there were actually people in Paul's day who professed to be Christians that lived unsurrendered lives. And Paul is concerned about that. He's saying, I urge you, brethren, I urge you to make your life a sacrifice to God. He is making an appeal to them. And really this is God's appeal through the Apostle Paul for people to get serious about God, to get passionate about their walk with Christ. I urge you... You, you may ask, God, why don't you ever answer my request? Well, you answered God's one request of you that you get serious in your life about surrendering yourself to Him. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your life a living and holy sacrifice. Now, I, wanna, I want you to think about a few things this morning. Number one, I guess, would be the basis for our surrender, and that is God making a request of us. But also God has a reason to expect that request to be honored. By the mercies of God, by the mercies of God. Have you ever 
Anybody that ever argues as to why God has a right to expect surrender out of their life does not understand the mercies of God. What God has actually done that you might have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What God did to put that book in your hand that you might have truth in front of you. Do you really understand the mercies of God? When you really do, then you won't argue and debate with God whether He has a right to expect obedience out of your life. So there is a basis for our surrender. But also there is a, a definition of surrender that you find here in, a, in chapter 12. We are told to present our bodies to God. To present our bodies to God. That means to do, to do something at a point in time that is going to have an effect through our whole life. That is one of those, those terms in Greek that is of an aorist tense, a tense we don't have in English. It means that you do something at a point in time, and it is past action, but it continues to have an effect throughout your whole life. Now, if you come to the point in your life where you have actually said, God, I surrender. I recognize who you are. I recognize the rights that you have to who I am. And I surrender control of my life for the rest of my life. Have you ever come to that point? There are a lot of people in churches today who have never come to that point. They are here acknowledging God, but they are in no way surrendered to God. They're not surrendered in, in, in the areas of time. They haven't surrendered their talents to God. They haven't surrendered their, their finances to God. They are holding all those things back to themselves, but they'll acknowledge God from time to time. Have you surrendered your life to God? I spent 20 years in the church. 20 years. My parents, as soon as I was born, they had me in the church. But it wasn't until 20 years later that I actually understood surrender. And I went through 20 years of really not having a sense of what God wanted for my life, what direction I was going in life. But after I came to that point of surrendering my life, it's amazing how God's will came into sharp focus in my life. After I settled that issue, then God began to have an open channel to speak to me. And some of you here today have not settled the issue of surrender in your life. You're still holding that back. You're holding something back from God. You haven't gotten to the place where you're willing to just trust God with it all. And it worries you because you think God's going to come in. He's going to disrupt your schedule. He's going to disrupt your time. He's going to demand certain things of, uh, of you in all these different areas of life. And you keep saying, it's mine, it's mine. You know, that is the spirit of this age. That we try to protect what is ours rather than surrender it over to God. I've shared before that in the 1960s in the church world, there was a transfer of terms that happened. Up until the mid-1960s, the term was understood to be one term, which at that time they began to use the term commitment. Christians began to be committed. They began to make a commitment to this or a commitment to that. Up until the mid-1960s, there was a different term, and that term was surrender. You know, there is a difference between being surrendered and being committed. You can commit certain things to God. God, I commit to be in church so many times this year. God, I commit a certain amount of my finances to you. We can make commitments and yet not be surrendered. Commitment touches little parts of us. Surrender says, God, it's all yours. It affects everything about us. And Paul is saying we need to present ourselves to God as living and holy sacrifice. Present our bodies. Three ways he puts it. Number one, we present our bodies. Number two, we present our mind. And number three, we present our will to God. First, he says our bodies. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. When I think of my, my body, I think of it in two ways. Number one, I think, God, why do you want my body? I think of my body as being weak. I think it, it as being susceptible to temptation. I think of it as uh, having a lot of flaws. But it tells me that God is saying, come to me just like you are. The person that you are, 
Come to me and bring that as a sacrifice to me. But the second thing that I think of when I think about my body is my body encases everything about me. It encases my actions, my deeds, my thoughts, my goals, my motives, my attitudes. All of that is to go on the altar. I become in my body a living and holy sacrifice to God, to be offered up to God himself. Now, if you notice, he described it two ways. Your body is to be a living sacrifice and a holy sacrifice. What do you think of when you think of your body being a living sacrifice? You know, a lot of people say, God, I'm willing to give you the ultimate sacrifice, which is death. But actually, the ultimate sacrifice is life. For you to live 24 hours a day surrendered to God. You know, that to me is the most difficult challenge on this earth. It's not just facing the, uh, the executioner because your refusal to recount Christ. You know, that is so difficult and that is amazing. But for a person to live 24 hours a day, surrendered to God as a living sacrifice. That is what God asks of us. To be living and to be holy, to be set apart for the purposes of God. That means that my life has charted a course toward holiness, toward what is acceptable and pleasing to God. Is your life a sacrifice to God? Is it a living sacrifice? Is it a holy sacrifice? Are you seeking God's righteousness, hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God? Paul says we're to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. There was a man named uh, uh, General Booth who was the, the guy who started the Salvation Army. He was asked by an evangelist one day why God had used his life in such a, such a tremendous way. And his response was, you know, there are people, people who have better minds than I've got. There are people who have more talents than I have. There are people who have more resources than I've got. But God has gotten all of me that there is. God has gotten all of me that there is. Is that something you could say? You may not have all the talents in the world, all the resources in the world. You may not be the smartest person in the world. But who you are, God has gotten 100% of it. The problem with a living sacrifice is it always wants to get off the altar. And people will have moments or times or seasons of commitment, but they like to get back off the altar because it's not comfortable to be on God's altar. The uh, altar that they would use that Paul during Paul's time, the kind of altar they would use, would have two hooks on it. These would be called flesh hooks. And they would put the altar, the sacrifice on the altar, then they would use these flesh hooks to, to bind the, the sacrifice down. And someone has said that the two flesh hooks that keep the living sacrifice on the altar are the flesh hooks of devotion and discipline. And if you don't have those things in your life, then you are going to find yourself continually straying from God's altar. If you are not a disciplined person or a devoted person, and perfecting those two areas of your life. And a person who doesn't doesn't uh, get those areas right in their life, they're going to say things like this. You know, I don't want to join a church because I don't want to be bound down. I don't want to, to, uh, to obligate myself to a certain giving because I don't want to be tied down. I don't want to agree to teach a class because I may want to go do this or go do that. I just don't like to be bound down. There are a lot of people like that in our churches today. They haven't come to the point of saying, God, you're number one. God, you've got a plan for my life. I'm going to fit everything in around that. But that holds a priority of who I am. You know, that is what a surrendered life is all about. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God, which is acceptable 
The idea of the word acceptable is to be in agreement with his plan. As I thought about that and looked a little deeper at it, imagine yourself as that brand new parent that many of us were, holding that baby that God had given to us, this precious child that was brand new. And in your mind at that time, if you're like me, you got to, you got to thinking of all these plans and hopes that you had for this child's life. Maybe you even envisioned what this child would grow up to be if it, if it really was where your heart wanted this child to go. Or maybe you're standing at an altar and, and a husband and, a, and a, a future husband and a wife going through the marriage ceremony. And both of them envisioning what, what kind of marriage that, that their dreams would hold. And the idea of that child actually growing up and beginning to be those things that you had in your heart for that child to be. And how pleasing. The kind of feeling you would have inside as you looked at that child and you said, that's exactly what I had hoped that child to be. If that is what the idea is there, this would be acceptable, pleasing in agreement with God's plan. When we live a surrendered life, it makes the heart of God warm and brings a smile to God's face because it's acceptable. It's, it's pleasing to God. It's right in agreement with His plan. And that's what Paul is saying. And God's heart is broken because so many people are just tipping God whenever the offering goes by or just uh, just using Christianity as like a hobby that they do on weekends rather than giving themselves completely to God. Which category do you fit in? Now Paul says this is our spiritual service of worship. And you may have in a different, a different translation, you may have a reasonable service of worship. I think that's a better way of, of putting it because the word is the word logica. It's a Greek word that sounds like logical because that is exactly what it means. God can expect these things of us. In our response, because of who we recognize God to be, our response of obedience and living a sacrifice, surrendered life to Him, just makes sense. It is a logical response to what God has done for us. For God to expect that and for us to give back to Him our surrendered lives is just the rational, reasonable logical response to who he is. It's not something we should debate, resist. If we really see God for who he is and think about all that he has done, who we are, who we would be without him, it just makes sense for us to surrender our lives to God. In fact, this is our reasonable service of worship. We, we spent some time singing what we call worship. But you know, worship happens when you leave and you go out into the world. Monday through Saturday, that is when you really worship God. Your service of worship, your reasonable, reasonable response to what God has done is for you to go out and live lives in obedience to Him. So Paul says, number one, we need to present our bodies to God. The second thing that he says, we need to present our minds Present our minds. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want you to think about two concepts this morning, about two choices, I guess, that you have. One of conforming to the world and the other of being transformed by the Word of God. You're on two paths this morning, and I want you to think about which one is the definition or defining element of your life. Paul had used a one-time event to present our bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, to present that one-time surrender that we have. But what he says here about being conformed or do not, or do not be conformed or, or be transformed, these are present tense. That means it's something you do every day based on what you did at that one-time surrender. Because you surrendered your life, because you acknowledge God's proper place in your life, every day you do these two things. You don't let the world conform you, and you do be transformed. Two things you need to mentally make sure happens in your life every day. Now, to be conformed to the world means to allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. 
And that happens to everybody as they go into the workplace, they go into the school, the world begins to put its opinions, its pressures, try to fashion you down to be just like them. The kids at school say they're being different from the parents, but really they're being just like each other in the way they dress and the way they do their hair. And adults are just the same. We have that tendency to get squeezed into the mold around us. And Paul is saying, don't let that happen in your relationship to the world. Don't let it begin to conform you and to squeeze you in and to make you just like it because of the pressure that it puts upon you. The Bible tells that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. For you to try to stand out for Christ is going to bring a resistance, a friction with the world around you. Paul says don't do that, but on the other side, be transformed. Now, I want you to think about the concepts of being conformed or being transformed. Because some of you here today, just because you're here doesn't mean that you haven't been conformed. In fact, people in the pew today may be here because you're just conforming. You're conforming to expectations, conforming to certain uh, creed that you believe in. But it's really not coming from the inside. It is coming from the outside. Some pressures that you feel to do certain things. To be conformed is to respond to pressures from the outside. To be transformed is comes from power on the inside. That's the difference between the two. Now, are you here because you're being conformed? Or are you here because you're being transformed? Whenever the offering is passed, maybe you conform because you know people are looking, you want to give a certain thing. But to be transformed means that God, this is between me and you. I know exactly what you've asked in my life, and I'm going to respond in obedience to that. To be transformed means it comes from the inside. We get our word metamorphosis from it. And metamorphosis is what happens when a a caterpillar will be crawling along a tree branch and for whatever reason, at whatever time, all of a sudden it encases itself in a cocoon. And then out of that cocoon, after a certain amount of time, will come this beautiful butterfly. Something miraculous from our minds happened in the life of that caterpillar and all of a sudden it became a butterfly. Same word is used of Jesus when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he was transformed. Now, what it literally means is that what is inside comes to the surface. What we saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, what we saw described, was that Jesus, the deity that was in him, came to the surface and evidenced itself. That is what transformation is. It is what, when what is on the inside comes up for the world to see. And God has placed within each one of us a brand new nature. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There is something that, that has happened inside of us that the Bible describes as we have become new creatures in Christ. And whenever we don't let the world conform us and pressure us and squeeze us into its mold, but we allow the Word of God to renew us and allow the truth of who we are to come to the surface, then the world begins to see that inside being transformed and coming out for everybody to see. Paul is saying, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let that be the way that you fashion yourselves and form your opinions. But get in God's word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. How does the renewing of your mind happen? It happens by your giving yourself over to truth. Not the world's opinion of truth, but God's eternal truth. And as you give yourself over to that, as it begins to, to change the way that you uh, see yourself and see life and you make application of those truths and those principles, all of a sudden it transforms you. And, and Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And you begin to just, it changes what the world sees because... Christ in you comes to the surface, and the world is able to see that. But it takes a surrendered life, surrendered to God's word as your authority, and surrendered to God's way as the direction and priority of your life. 
I heard about a man who was walking through Chicago Union Station, train station he would go to very often. And he had been thinking about the concept of, of God's part in his life and how he had lived his life up to that point. And it just overwhelmed him. And he stopped in the middle of this train station, took his shoe and made a mark on the, on the floor in front of him, stepped on that mark and said, God, right here, right now, I surrender my life to you. I recognize your right to everything about me. I recognize who you are and who I am, and I surrender my life, every part of it, my future, my, uh, my goals, where you want to take me from this point on in life, it's your call. And then he went on. And every day or every time that he would come back to that train station, he would come to that mark again, and he would stop at that mark, and it would remind him of who he was, of who, what his relationship to God truly, truly meant and what it was. Do you have a place like that in your life where you have made peace with God's agenda for you? Stop resisting God and saying, God, I belong to you. I have been bought with a price. I am no longer my own. You are to call the shots in my life, and I'm reminded of that. You need things in your life that remind you, bring you back to that kind of truth and understanding in your life. We are to present our bodies. We are to present our minds as well. And finally, let me quickly share with you, we are to present our wills to God. The last part of, of verse 2, so that you may prove the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Good and acceptable and perfect. Your life can become a proving ground for God's handiwork. People can begin to look at you, to look at how you're living your life as you surrender to God and God has come to the surface in you as you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world can see you as a proof of what it really means to live for God. They can look at your family. They can look at your marriage. They can look at you personally. And they can get a glimpse of what it really means to be a person that God is using that has surrendered their life and their home to God. That threefold description that you find there, the description of it being good and acceptable and perfect, those are not adjectives. Those are what the, the Bible calls substantives. That means they're nouns. That means that when you prove, you're proving literally what is good. You're proving what is perfect or what is complete. You're proving what is acceptable or what is pleasing to God. People can look at your life and see a definition of goodness. A definition of what of acceptability from God's vantage point. They can see a definition of what God meant a person to be in the sense of being perfect or complete before God. Your life has everything, all the elements that God designed to be in the life of a person. But that doesn't just happen. That happens when we surrender our lives to God. You know, worship is getting up on the altar and letting God consume you. Letting God consume you. That means God consume every part of who I am. It is all yours. It's all to be consumed by who you are. You know, is that something that you have done in your life? Consecration is not giving God anything. Consecration is taking your hands off of what already belongs to God. It's recognizing what really God owns, letting it go, trusting it to God. There's a businessman I heard about who was sitting down trying to make a list about why he would stay at a particular job. And he tried to make a list of, of what the benefits of this job were. And he wrote down things like the salary, the, uh, the prestige that working for this particular company would bring him. He wrote down the, uh, 
opportunities for advancement that were at this particular place. He wrote down that he, he liked his job. It was something that was pleasing to him. And after he got this list made, he got to thinking, you know, this is a human list. Just about anybody would make up a list like this. So he tried to refocus his mind and think, what would God's list be? And he started to write down things like, that person at the desk next to me, they need a witness in their life. In fact, this whole company needs a witness for God in it. There are people in this company who have problems. They need God's answers to those problems in their life. This company allows me to have resources where I can give back to God's work. And he got the two lists written out, and he looked at one, he looked at the other, and he said, you know, this list really doesn't even begin to compare to this one. But you know what? Most people are living off that first list. When they go to work, that's the reason they're there. Why God wants you there, when you surrender your life, will begin to work off that second list. When you recognize a surrendered life lives off of those things as priorities. That is why God has put you here. That is why God has left you here. And that, that, those are the things that, that are the purposes of God in your life. Are you a surrendered person to God? Not that are you committed. Are you a surrendered person? You know, God spoke and said, in Isaiah's time, who shall we send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah spoke up and said, here I am. Send me. Now Isaiah stood alone. But Isaiah was a mouthpiece of God in his time. He surrendered his life to God. And God used him in a tremendous way. He wasn't the smartest man in his day. But God used him in a powerful way that we remember to today. Because he surrendered his life. Where do you want your life to go? I don't know how many years you've got left. But are those years worth placing in God's hands and saying, God, you hold the title deed to, to my life. I give it all to you. Take it. Use it. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Use me in the ways you want to use me. But God, I'm not just going to fool myself by saying I commit this or I commit that. But God, today... This mark in my life, I remember this day is the day I surrendered it all. I took my hands off of it and gave you my life.